Hey, my name is Andres Prichel, and today I want to teach you how to maintain your muscle mass during prolonged training breaks. So most lifters around the globe right now are in self-isolation or quarantine to help flatten the curve of the coronavirus. And I think many of us are concerned with our muscle mass. How are we going to maintain our muscle during this prolonged training break? We have no idea how long this is going to last, but what can we do right now to help maintain that muscle and so that when we get back to the gym, we can perform just like we used to? Well, here's how you can do it. To begin, I wanna show you just how difficult it is to lose muscle in the first place. A study by Huang et al. in 2017 showed no losses in muscle mass over a two week training break. The researchers note that since they observed no significant changes in total body weight or lean mass in either group over the course of the study, this suggests that the short term cessation of activity still allowed for a retention of lean mass. And another study by Tavares et al. in 2017 showed that over an eight-week period, strength athletes were able to maintain their strength and performance by training just once to twice a week. Following strength training, the participants were randomly allocated to one of three groups, reduced strength training with one RST1 or two sessions per week RST2 and seized training CT. In conclusion, the different reduced strength training frequencies applied were able to maintain muscle mass and strength performance obtained over the regular training period. This means that you can train just once a week with high volume or twice a week with reduced volume to maintain all of your muscle mass and strength for extended periods of time. So body weight training will suffice, but only if it's performed at a high enough intensity and getting close enough to failure. So a study by Lascivious et al. in 2019 provides us with valuable insight as to how we should approach body weight training if we wish to see gains comparable to what we'd see with standard weightlifting. This study investigated the effects of an eight-week resistance training program at low and high loads performed with and without achieving muscle failure on muscular strength and hypertrophy. The total training volume between all three conditions that were tested was the same. These researchers came across a pretty unique finding. They found that when training with low loads, training with a high level of effort seems to have a greater importance in total training volume in the accretion of muscle mass, whereas for high load training, muscle failure does not promote any additional benefits. So the takeaway here is that when you're going with low loads, such as body weight exercises, it's more important to go to failure than it is to try and match total volume as you would with a typical weightlifting session at higher loads. Finally, a study by Nobrega et al. in 2018 investigated the effects of resistance training at high and low intensities performed to muscle failure or volitional interruption, which is when you can no longer perform reps with perfect form on muscle strength, cross-sectional area, pination angle, and muscle activation. The researchers found that both high intensity 80% one rep max and low intensity 30% one rep max resistance training performed to volitional interruption are equally effective in promoting increases in muscular strength, muscle cross-sectional area, and pination angle as resistance training performed to muscular failure. So after looking at all these studies, what's the overall takeaway? Well, you certainly can see similar gains with bodyweight exercises as you would with traditional lifts, as long as you go to failure, as long as they are intense, and as long as you achieve similar volume. But still, total volume won't be as important as going to absolute failure or very close to it on each and every set. Something else I want to point out to you to put your mind at ease is that if you're feeling small throughout the next few weeks, it's more than likely due to a decrease in muscle glycogen. Glycogen is stored carbohydrate and the majority is stored in muscle mass, around 500 grams are stored in your muscle. For every gram of glycogen, there's around three and a half grams of water associated with it. Now think about this, muscle is more than 70% water, meaning if you're glycogen depleted, you're losing the majority of the volume in your muscle and you're gonna look and feel small. Now this is very noticeable in lifters because we tend to have lower levels of body fat and a lot of muscle in our bodies, meaning a slight decrease in muscle glycogen means that there's a significant decrease in our size, in our strength, and in our performance. And another reason why it's difficult to lose muscle is because when you build muscle, it's not just growing individual muscle cells, but it's also multiplying the cells. So there's hypertrophy and hyperplasia of muscle cells. And when you have this multiplication of nuclei in these muscle cells, it's very, very difficult to lose them. When you stimulate your satellite cells, which are what generate this increase in the nuclei, it's very difficult to then get rid of them. So if you do experience a loss in muscle, it's mostly gonna be due to shrinking of the muscle, not necessarily losing the nuclei. 
So now I have some dietary and nutrition recommendations to help you maintain as much muscle mass as possible during a prolonged training break. So number one is gonna be increasing or maintaining a high protein intake to keep a very positive nitrogen balance. When you have a very positive nitrogen balance, it means that the overall amino acid pool in your body is saturated. And your body's not gonna to have to go in and pull amino acids from your harder muscle mass to maintain itself. Because face it, you do need amino acids to run a number of bodily processes on a daily basis. At any given moment, you're using some protein, some amount of carbs, and some fat to keep your body running. Now the best protein source is gonna be that which contains a wide spectrum or a full spectrum of amino acids. So the number one is gonna be whey protein or animal protein from fish, chicken, beef, eggs, and milk. Now for the plant-based folks out there, you have to keep in mind that protein from plants is not as bioavailable. So you still can get enough and you can still get a complete spectrum of amino acids, but you're gonna to have to eat slightly more, about 20 to 30% more protein than what's recommended for a standard non-plant-based athlete. The two best plant-based protein sources are gonna be quinoa and soy. So my favorite combination of plant-based protein sources to establish a complete spectrum of amino acids is gonna be a combination of grains and legumes like rice and beans or rice and lentils. This is gonna give you all the amino acids you need to help you build or maintain your hard-earned muscle mass. Some other tips I have for you so that you can avoid or limit going catabolic and taking your muscle and converting it to sugar as an energy source, which is very common, especially when you're eating less or exercising less and your body wants to take away these amino acids and use them as a fuel source, is you wanna make sure you manage your stress because cortisol itself, the stress hormone, is very catabolic and you wanna make sure that you're getting enough sleep. Sleep is gonna be extremely important and it's proved by a ton, hundreds of studies out there. Sleep is gonna be extremely important for maintaining that muscle mass as well. But let's say you wanna use this time to focus on a different project, to maybe focus on school or on work or watching TV and movies all day. I have another trick up my sleeve that's backed by the best and latest scientific research that you can apply to your lifestyle to maintain as much muscle as possible and isolate fat loss when you experience these prolonged training breaks. And that technique is intermittent fasting. So this study on fasting by Moro et al. in 2016 is definitely one of my all-time favorite studies. The overall design of this study was virtually flawless. 34 resistance trained males were randomly assigned to time-restricted feeding TRF or normal diet groups. TRF subjects consumed 100% of their energy needs in an 8-hour period of time each day, with their caloric intake divided into 3 meals consumed at 1pm, 4pm, and 8pm. The remaining 16 hours per 24-hour period made up the fasting period. Subjects in the ND group consumed 100% of their energy needs divided into three meals consumed at 8 a.m., 1 p.m., and 8 p.m. Groups were matched for kilocalories consumed and macronutrient distribution. So the only difference was in when they ate their meals. After eight weeks, the two-way ANOVA showed a decrease in fat mass in the time-restricted feeding group compared to the normal diet group, while fat-free mass muscle area of the arm and thigh, and maximal strength were maintained in both groups. Testosterone and insulin-like growth factor 1 did decrease significantly in the time-restricted feeding group. Resting energy expenditure was unchanged, but a significant decrease in respiratory ratio was observed in the time-restricted feeding group. These results suggest that an intermittent fasting program in which all calories are consumed in an 8-hour window each day in conjunction with resistance training could improve some health-related biomarkers, decrease fat mass, and maintain muscle mass in resistance trained males. The mechanism for greater fat loss in the intermittent fasting group cannot simply be explained by changes in the quantity quality of diet, but rather by the different temporal meal distribution. Now, I was very impressed with the overall study design, but if there's one detail that really blew my mind, it's that even though both groups consumed 100% of their energy requirements on a daily basis, the TRF, or time-restricted feeding slash intermittent fasting group, saw an average of 16% drop in body fat. The researchers suggest maybe due to a combination of three different factors, an increase in epinephrine, 
a decrease in RR or RQ, the respiratory quotient, suggesting that these individuals became more fat adapted and were using a high proportion of fat for fuel at any given moment, and an increase in mitochondrial biogenesis. So mitochondrial biogenesis is the growth of new mitochondria. With more mitochondria, more powerhouses of the cell, you'd be burning more calories at rest to maintain different tissues in your body. More mitochondria equals a higher demand for energy at any given moment. And other studies show that with intermittent fasting, you become more fat adapted. There are changes in your gut microbiome and in your mitochondria themselves where the body begins to choose fat and in higher proportions as a fuel source at any given moment. The subjects in this study, for example, did become more fat adapted and you can tell by taking a look at their RR, the respiratory quotient. The lower the quotient, the more fat adapted you are and the more fat you're using proportionally at any given moment to maintain your body. So intermittent fasting is great for weight loss, for example, because with a shorter feeding period, you're more likely to eat less, meaning you'll lose weight. But with intermittent fasting, the more fat adapted you become, you learn to better spare muscle tissue when you're in a state of caloric deficit. Instead, you burn higher proportions of fat for fuel to keep you going. Now, another important detail of this study is that the individuals who were on the fasting protocol did see a decrease in testosterone and IGF-1, two very potent anabolic hormones that would help you gain muscle. When you see a decrease in those hormones, it becomes extremely difficult to gain muscle. It's really inefficient. So this protocol, the fasting protocol, should really only be used to maintain as much muscle as possible. It's gonna be extremely difficult to gain muscle with intermittent fasting. So what I recommend for almost anyone experiencing a long training break or who maybe doesn't have access to a gym right now is to definitely intermittent fast because you're gonna be able to maintain your muscle and limit how much fat you gain when you decrease your energy expenditure because you're doing less activity. Another reason why I recommend intermittent fasting in a situation like this is because there's so many cognitive benefits associated with it. According to a review on fasting published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the best medical journal in the world, intermittent fasting elicits evolutionarily conserved adaptive cellular responses that improve glucose regulation, increase stress resistance, and suppress inflammation all of which could be extremely beneficial in a situation like this one with this pandemic. This review notes that collectively, the organism responds to intermittent fasting by minimizing anabolic processes such as synthesis, growth, and reproduction, and favors maintenance and repair systems, enhancing stress resistance, recycling damaged molecules, stimulating mitochondrial biogenesis, and promoting cell survival, all of which support improvements in health and disease resistance. In addition, this study mentions how emerging findings suggest that the metabolic switch from glucose to fatty acid derived ketones represents an evolutionarily conserved trigger point that shifts metabolism from lipid slash cholesterol synthesis and fat storage to mobilization of fat through fatty acid oxidation and fatty acid derived ketones which serve to preserve muscle mass and function. Considering that this is a complete review on fasting by the best medical journal in the world, this definitely supports the previous studies we discussed and gives them even more credibility and validity. So to wrap things up, some of the best and latest scientific research does suggest that fasting can be an incredible tool for maintaining muscle mass, especially when it's combined with body weight training or resistance training. 